Now time for members' statement. Member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise today to thank the members from Ottawa, Orleans, as well as Toronto, Danforth, because this morning they sponsored a breakfast whereby we heard one side of the neonicotinoid issue in Ontario. The, the speaker was from France, and he, and he shared a lot of good information. But I want to make sure that in this House we have balance in information that we access and we understand in order to make informed decisions. And I just want to share with everyone that right now, here in Ontario, many farmers are being left in the dark. Regulations are not clear, and this government would not give the details that farmers are looking for. I recently read an article by Lindsay Smith. Actually, it was published uh, just yesterday, May 27th. And this reporter was fiercely trying to get, find information and get answers on neonic regulations. The reporter contacted the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, OMAFRA, and the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Minister's Office directly, all to no avail. And the worst case scenario was concluded by the reporter in saying that MOECC is really out to get pesticide use in agriculture, but the best case scenario, Speaker, is that they're incompetent. Speaker, Ontario farmers just ask that their industry be predictable, bankable, and sustainable. And we need answers before July 1st. Thank you very much. Thank you. The member statements. The member from uh, London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I rise today as MPP for London West and NDP Women's Issues Critic to applaud the leadership of two young women, Laura Anderson from my community of London and Alexi Halkett from Etobicoke. These secondary school students are challenging sexist attitudes and rape culture by questioning their school dress codes. Both were sent home from school this week for wearing clothing that school officials said violated their school dress codes, a tank top in Laura's case and a crop top in Alexi's. In response, solidarity protests by their female and male peers were organized at both schools, and social media hashtags my body, my business, and crop top day have gone viral. It is fitting that public and media attention is being focused on this issue during the month of May, Sexual Assault Prevention Month. These young women and their supporters point out that some school dress codes may perpetuate rape culture by objectifying and over-sexualizing women's bodies and stereotyping men as sexual animals unable to control themselves at the sight of a woman's bare shoulder or midriff. They may perpetuate victim-blaming by conveying the message that it is women who must be responsible for keeping men at bay. Let's teach boys to treat girls as peers instead of sexual objects and look for other ways to teach students about appropriate dress in the workplace. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to share with you news today from my riding of Kitchener Centre, and it concerns our main public library, which is a very much valued community resource. Named as the new Chief Executive Officer is Mary Chevreau, who's lived in our region since 1989 and has served on the board and the Library Foundation. She said that this is, quote, such a great opportunity adding that the library that we used to use as kids is certainly not the library of today or what we're going to see in the future. Back in 1884, when our first free public library opened its doors, the collection included 3,000 books and a reading room that had newspapers and periodicals. Today, the main branch on Queen Street, after a $40 million renovation project, supported in part by our province, features a two-story atrium, a children's library, computers, a digital media lab, a 3D printer, make-your-own-music stations, a spectacular public art installation at the entrance, and, of course, lots of books. Ms. Chevreau has said that one of her goals as the new CEO is to find ways to attract more people to the library. Soon they're going to launch an interactive survey to learn what people want to experience at our library. Mr. Speaker, it's still one of the best deals anywhere. A free library card can open a world of knowledge to anyone of any age, and I wish her and the staff at KPL much success. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can't tell you, Mr. Speaker, how disappointed today to learn that the Minister of Training, College, University, 
uh, has denied an application by um, Durham College and Rescon uh, for the app for the training de delivery agency status at um, for, for tower crane operators at uh, Durham College. This would have introduced a competition system, a, a competition into the system. There would have absolutely been no cost whatsoever to the province of Ontario, to the government of Ontario, and it would have been it would have improved safety and 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 actually gave competition to this very valued uh, trade. Uh, for, apparently, the minister has denied it. Um, he's, he's, he's denied it, and will there be no appeal? Well, I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, this is wrong. As a, as a power, as the Shame. as a community college system turns 50 years old in 2017, they've actually created thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs, and they are the leading training agency yep. for the province of Ontario. And yet we got a minister who doesn't want to add competition to the system. One one union, the powers and en power engineers, they op they they they. they they take credit for the whole program. They do it on, under their terms, and there's no competition for this very valued industry. So I want to say that uh, I want to thank uh, Durham President uh, Donna Dice and uh, Richard Lyle, the executive director of Rescon. I can tell those fo folks that this fight's a long way from over. We will not put, put up with this kind of nonsense. This is completely wrong in our community college system in Ontario, and I hope everyone will fight this all the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members' statements. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to say how proud I am of the high school students in my riding, the riding of Sudbury, as well as Algoma Manitoulin, who rose and organized himself in reaction to the re recent teacher strike. My office was originally con contacted by a resident of a student of Nickel Belt who was on strike on Tuesday afternoon about a petition that had, at the time, over 2,600 students had signed. The petition was written by a new student organization that called himself Ontario Students' Right to be Heard. The petition called on the Ontario government to make the school board negotiate and respect the OSSTF teacher right to strike. Their request was simple, no to back-to-work legislation, yes to negotiation. They know that back-to-work legislation is a quick fix that leads to future disruption. It was a pleasure to introduce their petition. It stood at 2,600 signatures then. It is now at 5,400, over 5,400 signatures. Speaker, in uh, turbulent times, sometimes leaders are born. Listen to these names. Spencer Kalatak and Greg Lee from Low Island Park. Benjamin McKenzie and Annalisa Shandros from Sudbury Secondary, Mark McGrady from Barrydown College, Deneen Maher from Espanola High, Max Chapman from Manitoulin Secondary, Bailey McInnes and Phoenix Illis from Lockerbie Composite, and Vincent Leduc from Confederation uh, Secondary School. Congratulations to those young people. Thank you. The member from Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to a great Sudbarian who our community lost tragically and unexpectedly this past weekend. Rich Griffin packed a lot of life into his 52 years on earth. Most importantly, he was an incredible father to five-year-old Zoe, and he was a loving husband to his wife, Nancy. The two had lived what many called a legendary love story to them both, our deepest condolences. I knew Rich as a friend, and most of us knew him as the radio host for KISS 105.3 in Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, it was just it seemed like three weeks ago that we were at the father-daughter ball raising money for kids with cancer in Northern Ontario, and as usual, Rich and Gary were the hosts, and Rich was there having fun and dancing and, and enjoying himself <laughs> with all of the girls in attendance. Martin Luther King Jr. said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And for Rich Griffin, the answer was clear. He gave selflessly. This is a man who went above and beyond his work duties and helped a number of community organizations by hosting their events and fundraisers. He was always there to offer help, advice, and sometimes just to listen. In typical rich, rich fashion, Mr. Speaker, his last act on earth was to give one more time as an organ donor. His final gift will help eight people live better lives. This is who this wonderful man was, and Sudbury is truly a lesser place without him. And while our community is mourning the loss of a wonderful human being and a committed father and husband, he, we will also celebrate the precious years we did have with Rich 
And on behalf of Sudbury, I honour and remember him today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Stamos, the member from Halliburton, Ortha Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, Ontario Ombudsman Andre Moran released his much anticipated report on Hydro One's billing practices. The report highlighted what residents in my riding of Halliburton, Ortha Lakes Brock have experienced firsthand that Hydro One issued faulty bills to more than 100,000 customers. They mishandled the problem and tried to cover it up. For nearly two years, customers have struggled with pathetic customer service while trying to correct or pay their hydro bills. Instead of rapidly fixing the problem, Hydro One deliberately kept the situation under wraps, while the Minister of Energy turned a blind eye despite warnings and warnings and warnings, like my open letter in January of last year to him. The total cost to fix the botched revamp of Hydro One's billing system rang in at $88.3 million which will sadly be passed along to ratepayers. The Ombudsman's report also revealed that Mr. Moran was misled and lied to by Hydro One officials as he investigated billing problems. That is why the Ontario PCs have asked the Ontario Provincial Police to conduct an investigation into the serious breaches of conduct committed by employees of Hydro One. The CEO of Hydro One and the Minister of Energy have both claimed that all of the problems impacting the billing process have been resolved. However, that is not the case. My constituency office continues to receive and investigate new or reoccurring complaints. The Ombudsman tweeted that his office has already received 90 new complaints since the reports released on Monday. This government has been consistently missing in action, Thank you. and my constituents don't want to take it anymore. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today and talk about a very special month-long celebration that's been going on in our province for the last few days. May is Asian and South Asian Heritage Month in Ontario. It's a time to take a moment and remember our roots, and it's a time to celebrate. Celebrate our diversity, our amazing province, and the contributions of Canadians of South Asian and Asian descent. Today, our Asian and South Asian communities number close to two million people and are made up of people from all around the world. They speak many languages, practice many religions, and have many ethnicities. These various communities may have distinct identities, yet together, together their contributions have helped to define our country, our province, and our region's rich cultural identity. But it's not just about the numbers. The contributions of these communities to our province in business, science, culture, civic life, and more are immeasurable, and we are stronger for it. Mr. Speaker, our diversity makes us stronger as a region and as a province. It's the thread that binds us together and forms the amazing tapestry that we know as Ontario. That's why I was so pleased to host a reception for Halton South Asian community at my constituency office last Friday, and then on Sunday to visit one of our local Gurdwaras. It was great to see so many familiar faces and to celebrate the way that these communities have helped to transform our province. Asian and South Asian Heritage Month is a perfect time to recognize the contribution of these communities, and I'm glad to have been able to participate in this month-long celebration. Thank, Thank you. you. Further statements, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, later today, I'm introducing a uh, private members bill, uh, and it's a very important private members bill. It will be uh, putting forth uh, an initiative to mark February 15th as Angelman Syndrome Day in Ontario. Uh, with us today in the gallery, we have uh, uh, Nama Uzan, who is five years of age. Uh, her brother Nadav has been diagnosed with uh, Angelman syndrome and what she did is she took it upon herself to set up a lemonade stand and many lemonade stands to help raise money for research into Angelman syndrome uh, and uh, young, young uh, Nama has raised over $50,000. And I appreciate the support of all members of the House because this is the kind of initiative we can all support. And um, we're just trying to bring awareness to this uh, syndrome because I know Dr. Weber, who we spoke to from uh, University of South Florida, said that the cure is very close because they've identified the chromosome, it's chromosome 15. So if we can get some research dollars, 
uh, to the doctors. We can help, uh, help, help a lot of children, like Nama's uh, older brother, Nadab, who has it. So uh, that's why we're here today, and we'll be introducing that bill later on today. Thank you very much. Thank you.